All right, let's get started because I think we only have about uh, 45 minutes. And first thing I want to say is I, he mentioned that I do a lot of writing on the blog, so I talk to people online. So it's a real treat for me to be able to see actual people sitting in front of me. So um, we should have about five minutes at the end, five to ten minutes at the end for questions. So make sure if you have a question, remember it, and we'll save it for the end here. All right, so let's talk about... If God is good, why is there evil? On September 11th, 2001, in New York City, terrorists flew two planes into the World Trade Center. Some people were crushed, some people were burned to death, and some people chose to jump out the window and fall 100 stories rather than face the fire. Two documentary filmmakers happened to be in New York City that day, and they were following some firefighters around uh, to do a documentary on what they do. So they were on the scene, and they were able to get footage from inside the tower as people were being evacuated. And there's a haunting scene there in the lobby where you can see the firemen and the policemen going over the, evacu the evacuation plan, and in the background, you just keep hearing these loud Thuds. It's the bodies of the people who are jumping to their deaths. How could a God who loves, a God who hates evil, a God who is sovereign, the Christian God, exist in a world that has evil and suffering like this? Well, this is the problem of evil that philosophers have been debating for thousands of years. And here's how they might formulate that problem today. If God is all-knowing, he would know how to eliminate evil. If God is all-powerful, he could eliminate evil. If God is all-good, he would want to eliminate evil. But evil exists. Therefore, either he's too weak or ignorant to stop it, or he doesn't care. It doesn't exist at all. But they say, there can't be a God who is all-knowing and all-powerful, all and all-good, if evil exists. In other words, they say the existence of evil contradicts the existence of the Christian God. This is a, a, a favorite argument of atheists, and you can see why. Because, obviously, it's a very difficult intellectual problem, but it also has a very large emotional impact, and it's personal, because we've all suffered and we've all seen other people who have suffered. So we have a lot at stake in finding answers to this question so we can build up our trust in our, our good, powerful, om omniscient God. So in the time we have today, obviously we can only scratch the surface. This is a huge topic that many people have thought about over the centuries. But let's start by asking the question, what is evil? Evil is not a thing. There's not a substance called evil. Evil is just a twisting of what's good. It's, it's a loss of something. It's a failure to meet a standard. It's when things aren't the way that they should be. And it's only defined by its lack of goodness. So for example, think about purity. Purity is something that's good. Purity is an unspoiled state. It's the way that a thing ought to be. But impurity is not a thing in itself. It's just a corruption. It's just a loss of the purity. And it's important to note this because God didn't create a thing called evil. We know from Genesis 131 that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And evil didn't come into the picture until human beings chose to reject <coughs> God's rulership and go their own way, away from God and his perfect standard. Romans 5.12 says, Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sinned. When Adam and Eve decided to rebel against God, they became twisted and they took on a disability, not a physical disability, but a moral one. And this brokenness, this desire to sin, this rebellion against God has been passed on to every human being since that time. So this is how we find ourselves in the situation that we're in now. We live in a world of sin and evil because we all want to sin, so we all choose to sin. But atheists have a problem if they're going to challenge you with the uh, problem of evil. 
If they want to talk about the problem of evil, an atheist has to admit that there is evil. But here's the problem. Evil is a departure from the way things ought to be. It's a departure from a moral standard. But if there's no God, there is no standard that we're trying to meet. And Jay talked about this a little bit. There's no, there's no objective right or wrong. There's no way things ought to be. If we're all the result of, of blind chance, and there's no purpose for us, and there's no, there's no standard of right and wrong, then you can see how this would be. All that would be left would be preferences of individuals and societies. So if Nazi Germany decides that it would be best for them to kill Jews, and we decide it, that it's best for us to protect them, there's no standard that can judge between those two personal preferences if there's no God. And yet, we know that evil is more than just something we don't prefer, right? It has a moral quality that goes beyond personal preferences. And this is why the existence of evil, rather than, than disproving God, is actually evidence for a real standard, which is evidence for a real God. So atheists have a problem. If they want to talk about evil, they have to understand that there's a standard. And so, in fact, their challenge can be turned back against them. But let's get back to the problem, because we still have to figure out how we can reconcile evil with the existence of the Christian God. Can we reconcile God's omniscience, that he knows how to stop evil, his power, that he can stop evil, and his goodness, that he would want to stop evil, with the existence of evil? Now, first, I should point out, we have no idea how much evil God is currently preventing. Whenever people make this charge, I always wonder, how do you know he's not preventing evil? He, there could be tons of evil that he's preventing every day that we just don't see it happen. But clearly, he still is allowing evil, so this question still has to be answered. So out of these three claims about his attributes in the problem of evil, remember, if, if God is all-powerful, he can stop evil. If God is, is all-knowing, he'd know how to stop evil. And if God is all good, he'd want to stop evil. Of those three claims, I'm going to question the one about his goodness. Now, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to say that God isn't good. God is good. I'm just going to ask the question, what if we're mistaken about how a perfectly good God would act? What if there is a greater good than our comfort and lack of pain? Maybe in his infinitely good purposes, and because of his knowledge and power, he permits evil to occur for morally sufficient reasons. If this is the case, then this whole objection falls apart. Now, I don't presume to know all of God's reasons for allowing evil to exist. And I certainly don't know his reasons for any one particular evil that you might ask me about. But I'm going to offer you three reasons to help you work through the idea that God is good and powerful and all-knowing, yet can have morally sufficient reasons for allowing evil acts to occur. So the first of these reasons is to accomplish greater goods in his overall plan of redemption. There's one story that goes throughout the whole Bible, and it's the story. It's the story of creation, of our fall, which led to a twisting of everything that's good, it, of God raising up Abraham and creating a nation out of that one man, and of giving that nation of Israel laws that would create a culture that would reflect God to the world and would eventually give birth to the Messiah who would come and pay the penalty for our evil on the cross so that God could gather his people together and make them his children and then eventually resurrect them at the end of the world and create a new earth that will no longer have any sin or evil. Now this isn't just the story of the Bible. This is the story of history. And everything that happens plays a part in this main story. God is moving history in a particular way for a particular end. And since he's sovereign over history, even when people choose to, to do evil, God is working through that evil to bring about the good of his plan. Let's look at an, at an example of this in the Old Testament. Think about Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph. Joseph was favored by God and his father, so his brothers hated him and they wanted to get rid of him. So they sold him into slavery, and they told their father that he was dead. Now, I think we can all agree that 
this was a very evil action taken by his brothers. But because Joseph was sold into slavery, he eventually ended up in Egypt working for the Pharaoh, where he was able to save the lives of everyone in his family. And, and not just his family, because remember, we're talking about God's overall plan of redemption. By saving his family, he saved the entire nation of Israel and the Messiah who would eventually come from that nation. This is why at the end of the story in Genesis 50, when Joseph is reunited with his brothers, he says to them, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So there's an example from the Old Testament of God using evil to bring about a greater good in his overall plan of redemption. How about in the New Testament? Well, we have another example of God uses, using a person's suffering for good, for a greater purpose. In the New Testament, in the story in, of, in John 9, of the man who's born blind. Jesus and his disciples pass a blind man, and the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin that caused him to be born blind? But what Jesus says is, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then Jesus heals him. This man was born blind so that he could experience Jesus' healing and become his disciple. And so that all the people who were around them, and every generation since, since him who heard about this, could hear his story and see Jesus in all his glory and know him to be the Messiah. So the outcome of this man's suffering, both for the blind man and for the entire world, was of greater value than the suffering was painful. As Paul says in Romans 8.18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now that's certainly something to think about. We think about the worst things we've gone, to, we've gone through. That can't even be compared to what God is building for us through what's happening in this world so that we can enjoy him forever. So we've looked at the Old Testament, we've looked at the New Testament, and even today we continue to see people who, because of their suffering, realize their need to be forgiven by God, and they decide to follow Jesus. And I think the reason people do that is when things are going our way, we tend to brush off our own sin and the idea of our coming judgment. But God uses pain and suffering and the evil choices made by human beings to wake people up to their own weakness and sin and their need for him. And he uses that to gather them to himself. So accomplishing greater goods in his overall plan of redemption is one reason why I think God allows evil acts to occur. A second reason is to make us more like Christ. You're probably familiar with Romans 8.28, which is about God causing everything to work together for your good, but you might not be as familiar with the verse that comes directly after that one. Listen to how the two fit together. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be firstborn among many brethren. We see from these two verses together that the good that God is working toward in our lives is not an easy life where everything goes the way we want it to, but a life where we're being shaped to become like Christ. Paul says in Romans 5, 3, and 4, that God uses suffering to bring this about. He says, we exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulation produces character and character, oh sorry, <laughs> tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. We see one specific example of how God used suffering to shape Paul um, in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 where Paul says, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God showed them the truth about their weakness so that they would learn to depend on him and trust in him. And Paul thought it was worth it because just a few chapters later, this is what he says. Though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. 
for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And this is coming from Paul, who was beaten with rods and was stoned and shipwrecked. This Paul is calling all of these things light momentary affliction compared to what it would lead to. So it's all, it's all going to be worth it. In Randy Alcorn's book, If God is Good, he tells story after story of Christians who suffered the most horrific evils that you can imagine. But then he goes on to tell how each of those Christians found that God used that experience to shape them in ways that they're actually thankful for today. And here's how Randy Alcorn sums up what he saw in all of these people's stories. God uses suffering to purge sin from our lives, strengthen our commitment to him, force us to depend on his grace, bind us together with other believers, produce discernment, foster sensitivity, discipline our minds, impart wisdom, stretch our hope, cause us to know Christ better, make us long for truth, lead us to repentance of sin, teach us to give thanks in times of sorrow, increase our faith, and strengthen our character. And once he accomplishes such great things, often we can see that our suffering has been worth it. Again, Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If we are in Christ, we can trust that all things are working together for our good and for the good of God's plan. Now we see both of these goods, our good and the good of God's plan, in the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, and when he became very sick, his sister sent word to Jesus asking him to come and heal his friend. Now, the story of this in John 11 says something very interesting at this point. What it says is, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, did you catch that? Jesus stayed away and let Lazarus die because he loved him and his sisters. So we know that in some way, this was working for their good. So that's how we know it was working for their good. What about the good of God's plan? Well, we also know the purpose of this sickness in terms of God's overall plan because Jesus says, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Because Jesus loved Lazarus, he wanted him to have the joy of being part of revealing his glory to the world. Here's what pastor and author John Piper concludes from this story of Lazarus and the way it combines Lazarus' good and the good of God's overall plan. John Piper says, So what is love? What does it mean to be loved by Jesus? Love means giving us what we need most, and what we need most is not healing, but a full and endless experience of the glory of God. Love means giving us what will bring us the fullest and longest joy. And what is that? What will give you full and eternal joy? The answer of this text is clear. A revelation to your soul of the glory of God. Seeing and admiring and marveling at and savoring the glory of God in Jesus Christ. God never works for your good at the expense of the good of his plan. Nor does he work for the good of his plan at the expense of your good. He works the two together. But there are two facts I don't want you to miss in this. First, the working of these two goods together in the life of Lazarus and in our lives involved real suffering and pain. I don't want to minimize that. There will be suffering, there is suffering, and there's probably far more suffering than any of us will even ever understand. But the second thing is that even though Jesus knew that God was working for the good of Lazarus in his pain and death. Jesus still wept when he came to Lazarus' tomb with his family and friends. Now think about a mother who takes her two-year-old son to the doctor to get a shot to protect him from a disease that could possibly kill him. Now that child, that shot is nothing but pain and evil to that child, right? And that child's probably going to cry. And the mother knows that it's for the child's own good. But does that mean the mother's going to sit on the other side of the room and say, ah, shut up, kid? 
this is for your good. Why are you crying? Stop your crying. No, the mother's going to comfort the child. The mother's going to show the child compassion. And in the same way, in the same way, God cares about your pain and he won't leave you alone when you're going through it, even though he knows it's for your own good. He'll still be there to comfort you. Now, in the case of Lazarus and his family, it became clear to them why Lazarus had gone through this. But we can't always see right away the purpose of the pain that we're going through. Corrie Ten Boom was a Dutch woman who lived in, uh, in, in Holland, and she hid Jews from the Nazis in World War II. She was caught, and she was sent to a concentration camp. And in her book called The Hiding Place, she tells the story of how she and her sister found themselves living in flea-infested barracks. And as her sister was praying to God, how can we live in this place, she realized that the answer to her question was found in the very passage that they had read that morning, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, which says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so her sister insisted that they give thanks for the fleas. Well, of course, Corey thought this was crazy. She couldn't think of a single good reason why they should have to live with fleas. But she believed God's promise that all things work together for good. So she knew that whatever pain came into her life, and she experienced a lot of pain, whatever came into her life had a purpose for her good and for the good of God's plan. So they thanked God. And as the weeks went on, they started a worship service in those barracks at night with their fellow prisoners. And at first they were very cautious because they knew if they got caught, they'd be in a lot of trouble. But time went on and no guards ever came in to bother them. They couldn't figure, they couldn't figure out why. Until one day, one of the prisoners needed help from a guard with something. So she called on a guard and tried to get one to come into the room. And the guard absolutely refused to come in. You probably already guessed why. It was because of the fleas. Who would have thought that there would be a purpose for these fleas? But because of these fleas, they were able to have these worship services. Now, does this mean that you'll always see the, the good that comes out of your pain? No, because we don't have God's perspective. We can't see everything that's, that's being affected by what we're going through. But when Corey saw the good that came from the fleas, that strengthened her to trust God in the cases where she couldn't see the good that was coming from it. And in the same way, we can look back over history and over our own lives as time goes on, and we can see how God used our suffering, and this helps us to trust him when we don't have answers. So we've talked about two reasons um, that God uses evil to accomplish greater good in his, in his overall plan of redemption, to make us more like Christ, those are the two reasons we've talked about. But you might be thinking at this point, the only reason God needs to shape our character or work out any plan of redemption is because we're in a fallen world in the first place. Why create a world? Why create a world in which God knew that Adam and Eve would sin? Why allow it sin into the world in the first place? And I think this is a fair question. Uh, some people say that in order for real choices and real love to exist, God had to leave open the possibility that we would sin. Maybe that's true. But when we're living on the new earth after we've been resurrected, uh, the Bible says that there will be no more sin or suffering. And God is promising there will be no more sin or suffering. We'll still be making real choices. We won't be robots. We'll still love God and we'll still love each other but will be recreated into beings who will never want to sin again, so will never choose to sin again. So it seems to me that if it's possible for free moral agents to only choose to do what's right in the future, that it seems like this should have been possible from the beginning. So that still leaves this question open. Why? Why did God allow sin into this world? Well, God never spells out the answer to this question in the Bible for us. But I'm going to offer you an idea to consider as the third reason why God allows the existence of evil in this world and, and why that is compatible 
with an all-loving, all-powerful God. And the idea comes from first looking at the big picture of what God's purpose is for this world, and second, looking at or thinking about whether or not there's something about a world where people sin that could actually end up furthering God's greatest goal in a way that an unfallen world never could have. And looking at these two things, God's purpose and how a fallen world achieves that purpose, I do think there is one goal that God values more than anything else that could never have been fully achieved in an unfallen world. Now, God's greatest goal in this world isn't to make our lives pain-free and comfortable. His greatest goal wasn't even to make us Christ-like. This world ultimately isn't mainly about us. God's ultimate loving goal was to create a world in which all aspects of his excellent nature would be revealed so that his people could fully know him and rightly glorify and enjoy him forever. So if God's greatest goal is to reveal himself fully to us for his glory and for our joy, how does allowing the existence of sin and evil in a fallen world uniquely accomplish this revelation of God's nature? Well, let's go back to 9-11 for just a minute because I always think of the heroes of Flight 93 as an illustration of how sin and evil can reveal a person's character. Now, as you know, there were the two planes that went into the World Trade Center, and there was a third plane that went into the Pentagon, but there was a fourth plane, and that plane was headed for the Capitol building or the White House. We don't know which it was. And on the way there, the passengers discovered what was happening. And they rose up against the terrorists, and they brought down the plane. They, they all died, but they protected everyone that would have been killed had the plane continued. Now, before 9-11, before, before the day that people on that flight would give their lives, before that time, these people went about their daily business doing ordinary things. And they had already developed the character invisible to us that would direct their actions on that day. But the depth of their self-sacrificing courage, which was invisible, wasn't made visible to us until their response to evil led to an expression of their character. Without the existence of evil in that moment, we would never have seen the extent of their courage and self-sacrifice. Now, in the same way, God was God before there was sin in the world. He was always full of grace. But without sin and our need for forgiveness, would we have known his grace? He was always just, but without our sin to judge, would we have seen his justice? Would we have ever seen a love that seeks out enemies if there had been no enemies? In a perfectly sinless world, we could have enjoyed much of God's kindness, but there would have been so much of God that we would never have known, and we would have been so much poorer throughout all eternity for not knowing these aspects of God's character. Now, just to be clear, evil isn't necessary for God's goodness to exist. God's goodness doesn't increase when we sin. He's been perfectly good throughout all eternity. But the presence of sin in the world is necessary for certain aspects of God's character and his goodness to be, to be revealed to us. As Romans 3, 5 says, our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. So if God's greatest goal is to reveal all of his perfections to us, which is a goal that's greater than our temporary comfort on earth, then in order for us to know God's grace, his mercy, his power, his justice, his righteousness, his love, and our need for him, he allowed sin into this world so that we could see and experience him in these ways. And the pinnacle of his revelation of himself happened on the cross. The cross which was where we in our sin put to death the Son of God was the greatest evil of all time perpetrated by human beings. And yet, just as in the case of Joseph, where what people meant for evil, God meant for good. In Ephesians 3.11, Paul refers to our reconciliation to God by Christ's work on the cross as, quote, the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. This was the eternal purpose. He eternally purposed to have Jesus die on the cross for us. 
So it was planned from all eternity. Why? I think it was to reveal his grace to us. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. And Ephesians 2, 7 says, Because of his great love with which he loved us, he saved us from our sins, quote, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He says that is the eternal purpose to reveal to us his grace. That was the goal of everything from the beginning. In other words, the cross isn't just a response by God to our sin and suffering. He actually created this world knowing that Adam and Eve would choose to sin because his greatest goal was to reveal himself and particularly his grace to us on the cross. That means that even with all its suffering, a world with the cross is, is better, a world where we more fully know and enjoy God, is a better world than one that, that doesn't have the cross and, and doesn't have suffering, but in which our knowledge and enjoyment of God would be forever stunted throughout all eternity. There was a man named John Newton who lived in England in the 1700s. And as a young man, he was forced to serve in the Navy. And he proceeded to live a wild life, drinking, gambling, and generally causing a lot of trouble for whatever ship he found himself on. And even worse, he eventually became a slave trader. And he participated in, in all the evils that go along with that. But his bad attitude and his sin eventually led him to a place where he was a servant of slaves on a plantation in West Africa where he almost died. But this wretch of a man found God's grace. He trusted in Christ and he was forgiven and he went on to be part of the fight that would outlaw slavery in all of Great Britain. Looking back on his life, he wrote this hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Who would have thought that that kind of love and grace from a perfectly holy and righteous God for a man like that was even possible? And that's the kind of grace that we would never have seen in an unfallen world. So we've looked at three reasons. First, to accomplish greater goods in God's overall plan of redemption. Second, to make us more like Christ. And third, to fully reveal himself to us. So we've seen some good purposes God has for allowing evil to continue in this world for a time until he's gathered all of his people to himself. But what's God's solution to evil now that it's here? The atheist calls for justice, and ultimately justice will be done. But this isn't necessarily good news for us. Because if, if God were to destroy all evil right now, he'd have to destroy you and me. And we don't understand the seriousness of our situation because we're very good at comparing ourselves to other people and coming up with justifications for the wrong, thing, the wrong things we do to explain why they're really not that bad. And several years ago, I came across a blog that was being written by a, a convicted murderer in prison. And in one of the posts, he happened to mention in passing that he was a good person. Now, we look at that and we say, wow, isn't that guy deluded? Comparing himself to the other prisoners didn't exactly give him an accurate picture of what it means to be good. Now, put him in a room with Mother Teresa, and he might have a slightly different perspective. But we're guilty of doing the same thing. We think we're good because we're comparing ourselves to people who are as sinful as we are. Now, do you think our idea that we're good would hold up any better if we were in a room with the perfect God of the universe? We all delude ourselves. We can never quite see our own sin for what it is. And I think if we could, we would probably despair. But if we could get just a glimpse of God's holiness, his perfect righteousness, we would realize our own sinfulness by comparison. And we see this happen in the Bible whenever someone finds himself standing in the presence of God. And here's how Isaiah describes what happened to him. In the year of King Uzziah's death, 
I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold, of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Remember, we're talking about Isaiah. This is a prophet of God who wrote part of the Bible. When he sees God, he says, Woe is me because he realizes how sinful he is. And I think when we come face to face with God, we will finally see the truth about the ugliness and evil of our sin and just how terrible our rebellion against a perfectly good being was. The real question we should be desperately asking is not why doesn't God bring about justice, but how can we receive mercy instead of justice? See, the atheist wants to have it both ways. First, he argues that a good God would bring evil to justice. And then he argues that a good God wouldn't send people to hell, not realizing that the punishment of sin in hell is the justice that he's asking for. But see, he wants both. And we recognize that both justice and grace are beautiful, good qualities that we would want a perfect being to have. But there's a real tension between justice, giving sinners the punishments that they do deserve, and grace, giving sinners the mercy and blessings they don't deserve. And that tension has to be resolved. God had to find a way to give people grace without compromising his justice and letting evil go unpunished. And so we find ourselves right back at the cross. My favorite passage in all of the Bible is, is Romans 3, 21 through 26, which explains why the cross is such a brilliant way for God to reveal himself to us. It says that we all deserve punishment because of our rebellion against a perfectly righteous God, but we can be completely forgiven as a gift by God's grace. Not because God lowered his standards and compromised the justice that our sins deserved, but because he upheld his perfect righteousness when Jesus took all the punishment for our sins on the cross. In one action on the cross, God both executed his perfect justice and secured for us the benefits of his self-giving grace. And he did this so that he would be perfectly just and the gracious justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, of the one who trusts in Jesus and in his sacrifice to pay for our sins. No other religion or philosophy I know of has found a way to keep, to keep both justice and grace without compromising one or the other. So, if there's no God, there's no evil, and there's no good. But we know that there is evil, and evil points to a real standard, which points to a real God. And a good God will ultimately bring about perfect justice. For those who give themselves to God by trusting in Christ, that perfect justice has already been completed by Christ on the cross. For those who continue to reject God, they will have to face that perfect justice on their own. But in either case, our good God puts an end to evil, but not before he's accomplished a goal that's worth not only the evil that happened on 9-11, but a goal that will swallow up all evil in its greatness. The goal of bringing people to himself, of making them more like Christ, and enabling them to see God and live with him forever in never-ending perfect joy forever and ever and ever.